Thank you for staying with us. Now, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Godfrey Onyama, has said that the country does not have the capacity and resources to absorb Nigerians abroad who want to come home immediately due to the global crisis caused by the coronavirus pandemic. This is coming days after the same ministry had promised the efforts to rescue these Nigerians um, while the issue was ongoing. Now, my question is, is the evacuation of these Nigerians in diaspora even safe for the Nigerians at home? Still with us to have a conversation around this is politician and gubernatorial candidate under the PDP Lagos State, Jimmy Agbaje. Um, also, Ali Baba, still with us on Skype. Thank you, Ali Baba, for staying with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, quickly, I need your reaction, sir, to the, the comment of the Minister of Foreign Affairs saying we don't have the capacity to have the Nigerians in diaspora who are itching to come back home. Um, the facility, we don't have enough the capacity to, to curtail them and have them come home. How, how do you react to this? Well, I think um, to some extent he's been truthful, but then we, we must understand. Ideally, um, anybody who wants to come back to his country, his homeland, his or her homeland, should be allowed to come back. But that's an ideal situation. Uh, but we're not in an, you know, we're, 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 we're in an emergency and there are issues. Um, even if you take a cue from America, from the UK and all, there are people here, uh, when the Americans said those who want to come back, they have an excess number that America is not able to bring, take back. Uh, and same thing with the UK and all the other European countries. So it's a similar thing. We don't have the kind of resources that they have. Um, and so our, ours will be limited. Now, so when you have a, so an, an ideal situation, yes, they must be allowed back. But what I think the minister is saying is, for you to come back, first we have to provide means of transportation. When you, when you do come back, we have, we have to isolate you for two weeks, and we probably have to feed you. Uh, we're, we, we presently have a problem of contact tracing, where, 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 where we've done much better now if the, if the results of 92% are correct. But then we don't want to add a situation where you come back and uh, we're still chasing your contacts, kind of. Because if we allow, if you allow them to go, I think they have a, an initial figure of 2,000. Now, if you allow 2,000 in, and all you need is about 100 or so to test positive, um, and you allow them to go to their individual homes, then they are adding to the problems. Uh, and so what he's saying basically is, let's first get our act together here before we bring you in and you see if, if, again, if the reports are right, the first batch of 40 persons that were tested in the UK, uh, 10 were positive. Yes. You know, so it's that if we're going to do it right and you come in, we must isolate you. All right. Now, Alibaba, I come to you. I, I said yesterday, some Northern governors were, were crying, saying that, as I, I said yesterday, some of them still don't have well-equipped isolation centers. Some don't even know, some don't even have at all. Now, we have about 2,000 Nigerians who want to come back. There are those in the U.S., the U.K., the United Arab Emirates, China, and we have 200 in Sudan as well as students. Now, I would have thought by now that each state would have provision for isolation centers, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. Your two cents on this. <laughs> the first thing, like uh, Jimmy said, is that the, the minister was very honest. Uh, unlike uh, the minister for labor... Uh, who, who said the Ingige? Who said we have enough doctors? We don't need doctors. So what are the Chinese people coming for tourism? Now you have uh, you have a failed state in in your health sector. The people who have complained about this health sector so many times. Um, Jimmy himself had complained about it and said that when he becomes a governor, he was going to address it. But you see, we do not have hospital space for these things. We do not even have hospitals that will take these people. So it is. The center that we actually have built that is tackling this for us. So the center, we don't have enough testing centers. Do you know that we have not even tested up to 10,000 people? So when you bring those other people, you will then compound them to what you are even having. Okay, you've not been able to test all the people that you have in Nigeria. You want to bring the people overseas here to test. You see, we have a, a case of uh, those of whom need you more need the government more than they need it. those people overseas now even have better chances to even get uh, unless italy where they have been overwhelmed but i believe that bringing anybody from overseas right now to it is like jumping from frying pan to fire we do not have the facility to accommodate those people we don't even have the facility to accommodate those of us that are here so it will be it will be suicidal to have them come back home to do what no, let me give you an example. Yeah. But let me give you an example, and then okay. I'll, I'll let uh, you go on. Uh, 
about like uh, two years ago, I was in uh, the UK and my wife was eating this okra soup with fresh fish and the bone got stuck in her throat. We started running up and down to get this bone out. We went to everywhere. They asked if we had uh, um, NHS uh, and if we're registered. And we said NHS. no. But you see, uh, I, Tonaya took us to a hospital. They took the bone out in less than 10 minutes, in fact, less than five minutes, uh, Dr. Dr. Ken or something, took the bone out, and then we asked for the bill. He said, oh, no, it's on NHS. There is no hospital in this Lagos that you will go to when you have that kind of emergency, that they will treat you immediately, first of all. You first buy form, register, pay for this one, pay for that one, before they now attend to that bone. So it is, we have a failed health sector, not, not a managing health sector, failed health sector. They, they, don't we have in the villa a hospital that, a medical center that was built with over two billion or something? And, and they can't treat, they can't even, they don't have, uh, uh, next question. Uh, there is. Oh, now, you, you want to react to that quickly. By now, I would have thought that every state would have, mm -hmm. you know, an, a well-equipped isolation center. But the pandemic is real. It's here with us. Yeah. But uh, some northern governors cried out yesterday saying, <laughs> as that yesterday, they still don't have isolation centers. Well, I think the, the, the um, I think, was it the presidential task force or the NCDC has made it clear, I think, the, I think it was the presidential task force, that every state government must have at least one isolation center of 300 beds. It is the responsibility of the state government to provide at least one isolation center with 300 beds. Um, it's not the job of the federal government. Yeah, but they also they claim that they've not gotten any support by way of funding from, from the federal government for them to, to execute this. Now, is, is there something we're missing out on, the intervention fund? No, you see, yeah. they have budgets. Yeah. And that's, I think, what Alibaba is saying, that you run a health system. Nobody is saying you must build from scratch. You have hospitals, you can convert your existing hospitals, you have guest houses, you can convert, but have a center of 300 beds. Move your beds from your hospital or put your beds in the hospital, put your ventilators if you have, if you don't have, you buy, um, and, and basically that's what it is. Nobody's saying build from scratch. So that is the minimum. When you do that, then you can be asking for support. You see, still this idea of sharing that, oh, there's some money being shared. 10 billion has been shared or 20 billion. Lagos State has got 10 billion. I also need to get my own 10 billion. What is the basis of your own 10 billion? You know, you must do something. You must have done something before you are asking for something. It's not about sharing. It's about need. You first make sure that you're ready to provide for your citizens a 300 bed isolation unit. Oh, now, Luba, the, the Nigerian government had pledged to assist citizens who want to return home, but said such returnees will bear the cost of the trip. Now, is this the right thing for them to do? It's the honest thing to say, because it's not the it's right the thing to do, but it's the honest to thing say. to say, because <laughs> they, do, they do not have the money, first of all, to accommodate those people. Uh, the isolation centers are costing so much money. So when they come back, what state will they go to? Would they all come to Lagos? Because if I am returning in that kind of position and I have that kind of medical situation or when I come, I get tested, I would like to be in Lagos. I would not like to be in Jigawa. I would not like to be in Yobe. I would not even like to be in, uh, in Akwa Ibom because Akwa Ibom has a stadium. Meanwhile, first, the governor of the state first denied that they had any cases, just like uh, Trump. You, you don't, you, you prepare, or is it Abia? where the state governor says that we are Abians, we are not, Corona cannot come to us. Instead of preparing for something like that, that would happen. What we have is that we have a, a fire brigade situation, a, a fire brigade response to a lot of situations. We have not prepared for all of this. So the people you want to bring back from overseas, if I were one of them, I'd rather stay. If, in fact, if the plane comes, the plane will go back empty if it were people like me, the plane would go back empty because I would not come to uncertainty and certainty. There's certainty that if I'm not an, um, if I'm not registered or if I, if I don't have residency in, uh, in America, that could be the problem. But if I'm in America and this kind of thing happens, I would rather be there because I'm sure of the health sector, I'm sure of job, I'm, uh, of my job uh, when, when everything is done. But if I come back here, the, now they want us to pay to come back to Nigeria. No, no, don't worry. Let me stay where they will pay me. 
Oh, Ali, there, okay. at least. Oh, Ali, but this, this will be my last question for you before I let you go tonight. Now, the Lagos State Governor, as His Excellency Babajide Saonlu, yesterday promised the deployment of more policemen in the state to secure the lives and property of residents of the state during the extended lockdown period. Now, prior to this extension, there were cases of police harassment and, and brutality, and if you know pretty well, in some states, there were even deaths. I mean, what is the security implication of more mobile policemen on our street, given the extension of this lockdown? Well, the thing is, it's, uh, it's, it's something that you cannot uh, do without because of the situation of the economics. Uh, people want to earn a living. People earn a living every day. And if you lock them down and you're not giving them palliatives, they have to find a way to survive. I'm, I'm one of those people I've been preaching, stay home, stay safe. But the thing is that what will they stay home with? They need to survive. Some of them have three, four children. Some people will have five. They have to feed those people daily. And so the reason Lagos State government has said that they need to bring those people in is that they need to make sure everybody stay home, stays home so they can stop the spread of this uh, virus. But without having people stay home, the virus will spread. People are playing football. People are going to the market because people want to hustle to get what they want. They'll they survive by. So I understand the situation. It's, uh, it's between the devil and the deep blue sea for the Lagos State governor. But he has chosen the right one to do, which is to get the uh, security personnel into Lagos so they can help to enforce that, uh, that lockdown um, instruction. Ali Baba Akbobome, thank you for joining us on Plus Politics and for your contribution. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for having me. Now, I need, I need your quick reaction to that. The security implication of more mobile policemen presence on our streets, there, there were reported cases of harassment and also yeah, criminal activities also. It's like the two-edged sword. Hmm. How do we begin to make sure at the end of the day that the, this mobile policemen are on the street enforcing the, the law and not necessarily taking advantage of, yeah. of innocent citizens? Well, I think it's a case of tough love. You know, you've got to um, provide the palliatives, uh, but then you've also got to enforce the law. Now... Uh, the governor has talked about food kitchens, for example, and very good idea. But I picture a situation where, you know, you're going to provide food for, um, what, 100,000 people per day. Uh, imagine a, a, a center where you're going to have to provide for maybe 100 people or 200 people, and you just have a deluge of people, you know, 1,000. They're going to come. They're not even going to allow you to give food. And so you're going to have people struggling for the pots and everything. At the end of the day, people are going to be picking stew from the floor and all that. And, and that's why I say it's tough love. You've got to put the two together. You've got to provide those palliatives. The people have to believe that you'll get to them. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to contain the anarchy that um, people are trying to the bring the about. The likelihood of you know, anarchy. Uh, because I, again, I keep saying that the, the security agencies, uh, the, the political leaders know those people creating problems um, in, in, in those local governments. Now, uh, as regards the security agents, yes. again, we, you know, it's still a case of where, you know, they say there's no, there's no law, then there's no offense. Um, we've had videos of how some of our security agents have maltreated people. I mean, you've, you've killed people. Over what? Over COVID-19? No, it's more than that. Uh, you must, you must. Um, you know, sanction them. Yes. You must prosecute those who misbehave. Um, so that, that, I think that's the way I, I, I want right. to put it. L lastly, this is a two weeks extension again. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and, and by way of this extension, many people are worried about the fact that there, there might not be still a solution in sight to, to the end of this extension. Are we, are we also going to see further extension? And Because something has got to be done. Something has to be pertinent yeah. and critical at this point in time. I think, I think it's, it's going to depend on the way we behave. Uh, and when I say behave, the way we uh, work on this lockdown. Um, again, the way I'll explain it is you have a cluster of people. Um, it's possible that in that cluster of two, of 100, of 10, nobody has coronavirus but they're all locked down. It means that in two weeks' time, they'll still be okay. If you have, and don't forget that corona, the, the COVID-19 um, is transmitted more by people, the majority of people that transmit don't have symptoms. And that's the dangerous part of it. 
You know, if I know that you have a corona a virus, then I would avoid you. But I don't know. You are normal. Yeah. And there is a fear of a community infection. Yeah. So, we're trying to, yeah. so, but if you have a cluster of, say, 500 or 100, and somebody has it, now there are two things that can happen. You have those that don't have symptoms. It means that over the period of two weeks or so, that will get out of their system, in which case they, they are now negative. Yes. And it means that that cluster is free. Um, if you do have somebody who has it, then you bring that person out of the system and isolate, making sure that all those who remain are clean. So by the time you run that process over a period of two weeks and another two weeks, you should be able to say yes to all intents and purposes we're relatively clean. And that's probably why, again, the Minister of External, or the you know, government is saying, don't, don't, don't come and don't add to our problems. In. Let's first you know, cleanse our system. And so, but you will find, if you look at the numbers, we started with, under, you know, with single digits. Yes. We then went on to double digits as in under 20. Now we've gone to 30s. Mm. You know, and, and so it's still, you can't say it's picked. So the whole idea is that hopefully in this period of two weeks, we'll be able to say we have contained to a great extent um, that rise and pray that we're able to then open up, um, e e even if it's going to be briefly, uh, to see what's going to happen. If you do get another rise, then there will be another lockdown. But um, hopefully, if it's done properly uh, in these next two weeks, we may have some relief. Now, my fear is that those other states that are not practicing uh, that are not doing well, uh, we could have a situation where a Lagos, an Ogun, maybe even an Abuja, um, would be relatively clean, and then they would start their problems. Uh, I mean, they would start their, you know, with their numbers, yeah. and you will find that those states will now say, well, you see, we don't want anybody coming into our state because we're clean. You know, we don't want anybody because we're clean. You know, and that, that, that could also play out. Mr. Jimmy Agbadi, <clears throat> thank you for your time in Plus Politics and for your insightful contribution. My pleasure. We'll go for a quick break now, and when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Stay with us. It was a sad day for residents and shop owners living on Frank Ojadi Close at Songotedo. The fire, which started at about 3 a.m., destroyed properties and shops belonging to residents. The residents said the fire servicemen from the Ilukweji unit and Lekki Phase 1, in collaboration with the Federal Fire Service Onikon, arrived at the scene by 4 a.m. to put out the fire. So the security staff called me at about um, 3.30 in the morning and um, said that there was fire. So I called the 112. And reported. They responded immediately. The problem was, after that call, I then walked down to this place that early morning. I noticed that it was a big inferno. We weren't seeing the fire people coming, so we called again. So I think it took close to about 30 minutes before they responded. And when they responded, they started working on the fire thing and brought it under control. But um, by then, the fire had gone so badly. They called us yesterday um, around 3.30 uh, a.m. thereabouts that the shop is on fire and you know everybody had to trip out you know try to bring out a uh, property and uh, goods so that everything because we're not really expecting a firefighter because we don't really count on them we have to do all we can to at least rescue most of the goods inside the shop. It was night and everybody was asleep only for us to wake up to people shouting, fire, 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 open your door, turn up your lights, there's fire. We couldn't really stress what happened, but when we came out, there were flames already. We tried to contain the fire, but of course, thanks to um, men of the Federal Fire Service, they came to our rescue at about 5.30 or so, they were already here. Just this morning that I come up to see the extent of loss that was, uh, I think about six shops are uh, burned down. Uh, and from my look, they were all electrical shops. Some of the shop owners just opened their shop this um, January. So the extent of loss is, is, is massive. A representative of the fire service. 
And this is my take. How the government plans to reach out to every Nigerian who is currently in need and referred to as poor and vulnerable may still be unclear. But the fact remains that these relief materials must get to the most vulnerable and poor, considering the fact that the homestay order has been extended by another two weeks. And yet still, there is no guarantee for the complete flattening the curve of COVID-19. The government can't be oblivious to the negative implications this extended stay-home order has and will bring on the economy, and especially on the poor population. Most of the people who belong to this category have only got a means of daily survival, and for them, COVID-19 could only make their pitiable condition worse. Already, there have been several reported cases of clashes between the people and the military officers on patrol enforcing the stay-home order, which have resulted in fatal injuries and even death in some cases. And we can only hope, with the presence of more mobile police officers on our streets, that this doesn't bring about more humans being harassed and brutalized and even possible escalation in protestation. If this happens, its reason may not be far-fetched because these people can only survive on daily economic activities which are now shut down due to the prevailing pandemic. The government should carefully manage the situation with greater considerations for the population of the people living in extreme poverty who may be experiencing a double tragedy at the moment of not being able to go about their daily livelihood and being vulnerable to contracting the deadly COVID-19. Again, the government should not and cannot be oblivious to the economic realities created by the outbreak of coronavirus. Hence, the effective management of the situation and the people must be top priority. Thank you for staying with us. Plus Politics returns tomorrow. Till then, be safe.